We all have a story to tell. Let's tell yours. Welcome to the Intellectual People Podcast with your host, Jason. Come together and listen to journey stories and more from interesting people. Welcome your host, Jason. Today on the Intellectual People Podcast, I have Nate Jones, who is president and CEO of Clear.com. How are you doing today, Nate? Well, I'm doing great. Um, you know, couldn't be better. I'm sitting in Utah. It's a sunny day and uh, enjoying myself. Wonderful. Nate, what is Clear.com? Well, Clear, well, Clear.com is a website, but Clear, um, you know, what we do is we actually make consumer products that are made with xylitol. And we really kind of are the pioneering company in the whole field of xylitol. And we've been in business for 21, almost 22, going on 22 years now. And, you know, I started it back then because my father, who was a physician, had actually invented a nasal spray that he was using with children to help prevent ear infections in those kids. And how many years ago was that when he was practicing? Uh, that was in 1998 okay. in West Texas. And he still lives out in West Texas. He is retired, but he does. Uh, he still lives out there in West Texas. So is clear something that he developed, like the, the actual ingredients he put together as a full package? No, he's the one that started using it in a nasal spray. And that, and that matters a lot. And so the story behind xylitol, I'll give a, a brief Please. Um, history of it. But xylitol is a sugar. It's a natural sugar. It's different than the sugars that we're commonly associating the name sugar with, like sucrose, glucose, fructose, and even the sugar alcohol, sorbitol, mannitol, maltitol. People are really familiar with those because that's what we use. That's table sugar. That's the, the sugar. That's, those are the sweeteners that are in the toothpaste that you buy at, at most of your stores. There, It's the sweetener that's in most of your gum products out there. Um but those are all sugars that feed the bacteria in your mouth that cause cavities. Even the sorbitol, which is found in most toothpaste and most chewing gums, is a six carbon sugar that feeds the bacteria that cause cavities. Which is absurd as that we still, decades after knowing this, that we still use toothpaste with sorbitol. Okay? Why is that, do you believe? Money. So the ADA is recommending that and endorsing that? Yeah. I mean, most of your toothpaste out there, I'm not going to, you know, name their name, sure. but most of them that are that are ADA approved all have sorbitol in. And and the thing is is that the strep mutans, they eat and they metabolize and they live and they thrive off of sorbitol. They don't make as much acid, and so those are considered non-cariogenic sugars. Okay? They don't promote tooth decay. So it's they, they're much safer to use than sucrose, glucose, fructose, which is kind of like, you know, airplane fuel for for those bacteria. And they go make acid and they and they, you know, dissolve your teeth and you get cavities. But we have known since the since the 60s, the first study on xylitol and how it works against tooth decay was published in 1969. We have known that long that xylitol actually gets rid of the bacteria that, that cause cavities. And it works and it works in a different way at at tooth decay and oral health than it does um, than what fluoride does. Like people are really familiar with fluoride and they're like, well, I use toothpaste with fluoride. That's all I got to do. And the analogy that I use a lot, and, I, and so, you know, maybe people have heard this is if you think of your tooth as a castle. OK, over there in France or Germany or England, you have this castle. And what fluoride does is it makes that castle wall stronger. That's what fluoride does. But if you have an invading army of bacteria, the strep mutans out there, and they're out there in the field out there making their little acid bombs and using their catapults and their trebuchets and shooting that acid up there, that fluoride is doing nothing for that army of bacteria. So why aren't we dressing that bacterial infection part of this disease as opposed to just trying to make the tooth strong? And that's what xylitol does. And xylitol goes out and gets rid of the bacteria that create the acid. Your father was using xylitol in the beginning nasally, not for oral health, correct? 
Correct. And and so how he came across that is in 1998, this website came on board on this new thing called the Internet back in 98. Um, I don't know if you've heard about it. I think it's still around. I think so. Um, but um, he went on PubMed and he was querying for something to any research to prevent ear infections in babies because he had a bunch of kids in his practice that were having recurrent ear infections, chronic upper respiratory issues. And one of those children was his, was his granddaughter. Her name was Heather, but Heather's mom knew and understood that kids that get chronic ear infections have a lot more learning disabilities later in life. And so she came to him and she goes, hey, dude, you're a doctor, solve this problem. I don't want my grandkid growing up having developmental issues because she kept getting sick as a kid because some doctor couldn't figure out how to stop her from getting ear infections. And so he went online and he started querying and reading through all these different studies. And when he queried preventing or reducing ear infections in kids, what kept coming up was all this dental research studies. And what it was is that the, the dental research studies were, they collect all this data. And, you know, and so if you're doing it, you have all this data on when these kids are getting sick. And what they found was that in the dental studies, the kids were using the xylitol gum and the xylitol products. Not only were they not getting cavities, but just by the chewing gum with xylitol, they were getting 42% fewer upper respiratory infections, fewer ear infections, stuff like that. And there was a paper that was published in 1998 in the Journal of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. And what that article pointed out is the way that xylitol blocks bacterial adhesion of strep pneumo, H flu, MCAT, and there's been a bunch of them on different bacteria like staph it's done since then. So we know that there's a wide variety of bacteria that xylitol just blocks their ability to adhere to tissue. And there have been studies done since then showing that xylitol does this, has the same effect on a number of viruses. The flu virus, I mean, there was a great paper that came out last summer that even showed that xylitol blocked the ability of the SARS-CoV-2 virus to adhere. I mean, so you have a wide variety of, of things for these um, flu, for, for the, you know, showing how bacteria and viruses and the xylitol blocks their ability to adhere to the tissue. So my dad read all that and he just said, well, babies are too young to chew gum. You can't give baby chewing gum. So he bought some xylitol, put it into a saline nasal spray, started washing out their nose and they stopped getting sick. Wow. That's incredible. And that's how it all started. That's how it started. And then how did you wind up picking up into the business? I mean, what were you going through early on? Well, the way that it, it happened is I used to work as, I, I, I know people are going to laugh. I used to work in Louisiana doing underwater welding, underwater construction out on the oil rigs. Okay. I worked for a company called Global Divers. Um, and I took a week off and I drove out to West Texas and I was sitting with my dad in his, in his little clinic. And a lady came in, one of these nurses came in and said, hey, there's a lady here. Uh, she wants some more of that jungle juice you mix up with the kids. And my dad and I just said, oh, dad, what are you doing now? And I mean, there's a whole story behind that, too. But he got up, walked out, and, you know, and then he comes back and he goes, yeah, this lady, she just drove from Arkansas to buy two bottles of this stuff from my dad. And I said, dad. What, tell me, what, the, what is it that some lady is willing to drive 16 hours, eight hours each way to buy two bottles of this, you know, $10 stuff that you're selling? And, and so he told me about it. And I said, well, if it works that well, do you, have you got a patent on it? And he goes, no. And I said, well, I think you should get a patent on that. So he did that. And that was that was the end of 98. Okay. Um, and so we sat around and and uh, he, he had actually wanted. Um, all of his children to start a company together, I guess, for all of us to have equal ownership in the company. Okay. And, and I just said, dad, that's not going to work. <laughs> okay. I come from a large family. Um, there's 14 children. Wow. And we don't get along with anything. We enjoy each other's company. We have uh, a wide variety. We have right wing, we have left wing, we have capitalists, we have socialists. And I knew and so he said, and so finally I said, I will go around to each one. And if they're willing to put in money or time, then, then we'll do it. And none of them wanted to. <laughs> All right. However, so, 
you decided that you wanted to do it. And so I quit my job in, at the end of 99, a year later, okay. and moved back here to Utah and started the company. From nothing. Well, I'm not going to say nothing. Uh, I had a great product and I had a $40,000 investment from a buddy of mine. That was it though. That's it. And did your father, was your father actively involved in the solution itself at that point? Well, when you mean in a solution, like, like we took his formula. You took his formula. And we went and just had a, we had a contract manufacturer start making it. They started making it. They made us two batches. Um, they, they, they screwed up the second batch um, to the point where it almost put us out of business. Um, but we had, so, so we started, we, we started the company. The first thing we did is we went to a bunch of medical conventions at, I think it was the first or the second medical convention we went to. We completely lucked out because there was a doctor there and his name is Dr. David Williams, but he wrote a newsletter that went out to like a quarter million people. And he wrote his almost his entire newsletter about this nasal spray. You know, we sat there and talked about it. He was already familiar with xylitol from the oral benefits. So he already had a good understanding of, of xylitol. But we explained it to him and, and it was just like an aha moment. Because what it boils down to is people, most of the time that people get sick or most of the time that people go and see a doctor, it, it, it's upper respiratory issues. I mean, you're talking about the cold, the flu, sinus infection, ear infections, allergies, asthma, all of these things start in the upper airway. And so it just makes sense that we should wash our nose, okay? And he picked up on that rather quickly. He wrote his article and two months later, this was in, um, it's a long time ago, but I think it was November okay. of 2000. And all of a sudden our phones just went ringing off the hook. And we went from doing about $5,000 a month to doing $5,000 a day in business. And it's never slowed down since then. Do you employ doctors on staff or consultants that are medical doctors to look over product? Um, I don't, I don't want to say that we employ um, doctors. Um, uh, and, I, and by doctors, I'm referring to both doctors and dentists. Uh, we have doctors and dentists that, that we work with that give us a lot of input and work with us on, on products and development. Okay. But the, the problem with, with hiring them and actually paying them is that the minute you do that, the way our government is set up and our healthcare regulations are set up, at that point, they can't go out and freely talk about what a product does because we're, we're constrained to say, as, to say what the product does because if, if and, I, and I'm, I'm gonna explain this, if you take a bar of soap and you say, I'm going to wash my hands just so they smell good. Well, that's a cosmetic claim. But if you say, I'm going to go take a bar of soap and I'm going to wash my hands because I don't want to get bacteria and I don't want to get sick. Well, now that's a drug claim. Same bar of soap, same everything else. It's just the purpose of what you're doing. Understood. And so if you're washing your nose with the purpose, and, and we're telling people to wash their nose for the purpose of not getting sick. Well, you know, then you get into some some hot water as to what the purpose of that is. Is it a drug or is it a cosmetic? Interesting. And and we've gone down the road with the FDA a couple of times and, and said, well, can we can what would it take to make it a drug? And they're like, well, you'd have to make xylitol a drug. There's no drugs in your product. And so, you know, it's it's how do you how do you go and do something when you can't really do it? Right. That's like saying, I'm going to go and I'm going to make sugar a drug. Being that the products are both used, whether it's orally or nasally, do they have to be approved by FDA or anybody else? No, they're not. They're not drugs. Because they're not drugs, they don't have to be approved. Yeah. Interesting. Is there any regulation? To them? Well, we're, we're regulated by the FDA because it's actually the, the food, drug, and cosmetics. Okay? okay. And so we're regulated by that. But some of our products are food, like chewing gum, the mints, the candies, stuff like that. Those are foods. Some of the products are drugs because a toothpaste with fluoride is a drug. 
So okay. all of the fluoride toothpaste are considered drugs. The, the, we actually have nasal sprays that have drug components to them. So those are also drugs. <clears throat> but we have other ones that are just cosmetics, which are, you know, the, the basic nasal spray. Uh, any of the toothpaste that we have that does not contain fluoride is not considered a drug. It's considered a cosmetic. And so we have a wide variety of, of products out there. Understood. And all of all of them are regulated under the, the, F, the Food and Drug Administration. I hope you don't mind me asking, but I will. And of course, you're more than welcome to say no. As far as the Federal Trade Commission goes... What do they look at clear as, and why do why do they look at it as an issue from the papers I've read? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't understand that because they have they've uh, you know they wrote us a warning letter and last year, and we went back and said, well, what's the problem here? And they said, well, you can't make claims. And we said, well, we're not making claims. What that is, is there's doctors out there that are recommending people use our products. And we're just off of our social media. We're linking to it. We're not making any claims. And they came back and said, well, if you're putting it on your social media, that's a claim. Which we had been doing that for 20 years and they didn't have a problem with it. I mean, you get into you get into the last, you know, 18 months, um, you know, since this COVID thing has hit. And, and, you know, I think our government actions are, are, this is my opinion. Do you believe, Nate, that they're trying to censor clear because there could be something there that it is helpful to the public and they are trying to hide that? I 100% believe that. I believe that there are bad actors in our government. And, and the reason why I'm saying that this is, this is not a product about, this is not a clear product, but our government has known since last June, let me, well, let me go back because our government has known, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in March of 2020, okay? okay? So right when all of this started happening, but it was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine and it pointed out that 90% of the viral load is in the nose, okay? If 90% of the viral load is in the nose, what's your first response? clean the nose <laughs> exactly yeah. but you know what they did it was a travesty and people died because of it they told people if you get it go home and self-isolate okay go home and self-isolate never in the history of medicine has anybody given somebody such poor but well okay maybe modern medicine okay right. people know you need to treat it early you need to treat it hard quick and the other thing that they've known is this is that the NIH, they paid for a study using salt water. And this was a study that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association last year. OK, I'm, I'm trying to remember the exact date of publication. It's on our Web page. Nothing to do with clear. OK, nothing to do with clear. This is using salt water. Vanderbilt University paid for by the NIH. They took 80 people who had COVID, testing positive, had symptoms, they had them use salt water, irrigation in their nose. 80 people, they all got better. Mm. Okay, 100% effective in that group. You would think that the NIH, you would think that the CDC, you would think that some of these groups would be all over talking about that. Right. But they're not. And I don't understand if they really, truly, honestly had our, the, the, the citizens of the United States and the citizens of the world, if they really, truly had their best interests at heart, they would have said, you know what? Wear a mask and wash your nose. Practice nasal hygiene. But they didn't. And I know they know that they've seen it because we sent all that information to them. No response? No response. Other than the FTC coming in and trying to threaten us and tell us we can't share science. Interesting. Has Clear done independent studies of nasal cleaning with Clear, the product? Yeah. Um, we have an ongoing study right now. Uh, we started it in Florida, um, but it became problematic to do it. Even the FTC told it, told our attorneys 
that it was problematic if we continued to do research in the U.S. and share those studies, which to me, again, boggles my mind. Um, but we so we did a bunch of studies that were in vitro looking to see how, um, you know, how our products in vitro. And these are all in vitro. Um, how our products would work against the virus and in vitro and and not everything and i'll make this clear this is you know that not everything that's in vitro translates to vivo to in you know to to working in in people right but that's what but that's what we're proved that's what we're working on showing now and we had a pay we had a study that was that was supposed to have started in the uk uh, earlier this year um but but uh they're trying to figure out whether they can import it into the UK. I mean, it, because we are in that gray area between a cosmetic and a drug, the people doing the research are like, well, you're a drug. And I'm like, no, we're actually registered in the UK as a medical device. We sell in the UK and our products are available to be purchased in the UK. And they kept coming back and forth and going, well, we think it should be done as a drug. And it took them about six months wow. to, to figure out how to do all that. And it just just yesterday, no, today's today's Tuesday. So it was yesterday that we finally got the email from them saying, hey, we've got it all ready. We've got it all figured out. The the uh, health. What is it called? The health. It's not HHS. That's here in the U.S. The NHS, National Health Service. Um, you know, they've given us the approval and we can start importing these products and, and get this study done. And but how long? That's, that's a study where they're going to get. 80 people that have tested positive and and uh, have symptoms and all they're going to do is have them start using clear a couple times a day and they're going to measure and use the pcr test and measure until they're negative and see what that time to negativity is okay so but that has not been done we're working on this and just for the viewers so they know how do you actually use clear nasally um, I use it. It's a spray. This is how hard it is. Done. That's it. That's it. Can you overdo it? Uh, my kids open the bottles and drink it. No, you can't. You can't. No. Okay. Is it also good for allergies and that type of treatment as well? Well, so I have to be careful what I say there, because if I say it's good for allergies, that's a drug claim. But what it does do is it helps your body naturally wash away pollen and dander, all those other things. Because um, if you if you think about how your nose works, OK, um, you, you have this mucosal layer that sits, you know, and I'm going to maybe I should just say snot. But you have this layer of snot that, that sits on top of this these these little cilia hair. And that hair is inside what they call the airway surface liquid. And the mucus pulls water from that airway surface liquid. And the airway surface liquid pulls its moisture from the tissue underneath. Okay, And it's actually a very complex system that keeps all of that regulated. Uh, when people use a saline spray, the salt water is actually transported from the mucosal layer into the tissue. And so in a while, in, in about 30 minutes after you use a saline spray, the, the the mucus layer is the snot is going to start drying out. And, and you don't really want dry mucus. You want your mucus to be moist because if it's moist, it traps more dander, more pollen, bacteria, viruses. It traps that and washes it away. If it's dried up and clumpy, it's not trapping it. And if you're, you know, and if you're using antihistamines, decongestants, steroids, those are all designed to uh, to help slow down the production of mucus to dry that up but what happens if you dry up that mucus too often well then you start getting biofilms and then you start getting more and more upper respiratory issues because all you're doing is providing an open route for all of those those uh, irritants to travel right down to your lungs nate how often should somebody do a nasal wash um well it, first of all it depends because there's a variety of different nasal washes um, you know, a lot of people do irrigation and irrigation. Um, it's good to use it every now and then. It's not good to use it two or three times a day. And, you know, some people come back and say, well, my doctor told me to do it. And I say, well, if your doctor told you to do it, then do it. 
but you can always go back to your doctor and say, hey, think of it this way, okay? And your doctor should, if they're a good doctor, should, you know, listen to what you're saying. But if you're using a nasal spray, you can use it two or three times a day, three or four times a day if you want. What we tell people is, is to use it once in the morning, once at night. Put a nasal spray with your toothbrush. Use it in the morning when you brush your teeth. Use it at night when you brush your teeth. If you're working in a hospital setting or a school, use it every three or four hours. The reason why that three or four hours is, is important is because your mucociliary clearance cycle, the time that, uh, gosh, this camera's backwards, but the time that it makes mucus up here, it takes three to four hours for it to travel back to there. Okay. okay. So if you're using it every three or four hours, you're going to constantly have you're going to be constantly uh, moisturizing your mucus and helping and facilitating that cleansing mechanism. Okay. If you're using a, a irrigation bottle, um, go back to your physician and tell them and say, Hey, is, is this really the best thing? Because what irrigation bottles do, and there is a time and a place for them, just like there's a time and a place for antihistamines and decongestants and steroids. But all four of those things are way overused in our society. Okay. And there are actually uh, papers written about this, how the overuse of irrigation bottles is detrimental. And the reason why is because it removes that entire protective layer of mucus. And if you don't have that layer of mucus, then you're really exposing all of the underlying tissue to all the bacteria and the viruses that you're breathing in for the next three or four hours until your body replaces that mucosal layer. If you thin that mucosal layer out, liquefy it, you're going to be able to trap more bacteria, more viruses, more dander, more pollen, and get it all washed away. And just so we're clear, so everybody understands, when you say irrigation, you're speaking to something like a neti pot. Correct. I wish I had one here in my office, but I don't. And I would show you, I have a nasal spray bottle, but I don't have an irrigation bottle. Sorry. It's okay. It's all right. But, but a neti pot would be an irrigation system, correct? Correct. Yeah. You close off one nostril and it literally flushes through from one to the other side and then out. And it's really flushing it. Correct. Okay. And, and those are, those are really good to be used post-surgery. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and even if you're using one of those, you should use one with xylitol in it. But, you know, I don't, I don't want to offend anybody. And sometimes when I, when I use this analogy, some people get a little offended. Um, but, but don't get offended because I'm using it to make the point. Because physicians used to tell women to use douches, okay? For decades, decades and decades, they told them to. And at the end, in the mid-90s, what did they realize? That it caused more harm than good. Yep. And when you're doing that to your nose, that's exactly what you're doing. Makes perfect sense. If, if you say it in French, they use the word douching, right? right? They're not using the rinsing. They're not using an eddy pot. They're, they're douching their nose. Right. Okay. But that's what they're doing. And so so there was a doctor in Asuli who is at, a, at uh, Georgetown in, in Washington, D.C. And he's actually published a couple of papers, but he took a bunch of his patients who used irrigation on a regular basis, had them stop, and 60% of their symptoms just went away. Interesting. Because they were washing away all the good bacteria as well Correct. as the bad, bad bacteria. As, as well as the mucosal layer that's protected. Is it the same then orally, where if you use a mouthwash, say, you wind up killing all of that good bacteria in your mouth orally as well, where with xylitol, you wouldn't? Um, yes. In fact, there's. I could go on about this. In fact, that's a whole different topic. But, um, you know, when you're using something that is bacteria, in fact, I'm going to say germicidal. Okay. okay, something that kills everything. Um, that's that's actually a horrible, horrible thing to do to your mouth, because we have a lot of, of mental, um good bacteria, beneficial bacteria that live in our mouth. Absolutely. And when we use a, a mouthwash that has higher than a 10 or a 15 percent alcohol content, you're killing all of that bacteria. And the interesting thing is that to, to put this into perspective, the. Bacteria that help create the enzymes to help us digest gluten, to help us digest milk, live in the mouth. Okay? We start using these germicidal 
mouthwashes, and look what happens. Interesting. Okay. Now we have a bunch of people that are lactose intolerant. We have a bunch of people who are gluten intolerant. And and there's a doctor, Mark Cannon, who, who you know is one of the most brilliant doctors that I know out of Northwestern University who he goes out and lectures on this topic. And it's you listen to his lectures and they're just they're just amazing because he can pack as much information into a into a 45 minute lecture as anybody else I've ever talked to. Sounds like I need to try to get him on here. I'll I'll set it up. That'd He's, be awesome. He is a genius. Um, you know, he works. He he was in in Rome last week presenting on um, using xylitol as a prebiotic to help would... grow good microbiome in the gut. Wow. Um, you know, but he was there in Rome last week. He, you know, I would love to have him on. Absolutely, that sounds great. Okay. So it is very important to not be using alcohol in your mouth on a on even on a daily basis. Is that? Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. What, what, in your opinion, in, as the owner of Clear, would be the ideal mouth and nasal hair regimen? Using our products, of course. Of course. No, um, no in fact, I, I tell people all the time that what you should do is, is uh, uh, you know, follow what your doctors and your dentists say. Brush your teeth in the morning. Brush them at night. The, the next thing you do is start working on your on your microbiome in your mouth and choose xylitol gum. Make sure the toothpaste you're using has xylitol in it, whether it's Spry, which is our brand, or whether it's any of the other many brands of toothpaste that use xylitol. Just make sure that the toothpaste has xylitol as its number one ingredient. Okay, Most of your toothpaste that are out there are using sorbitol. And you know maybe we discuss this, using sorbitol actually feeds the bacteria that cause cavities. That's Why? I mean, it's mind-boggling. It is. And we've known that for decades. But, you know, uh, xylitol costs about five times what sorbitol does. So There it is. And, you know, there it is. Um, and then find a gum that has xylitol in it. Not has xylitol, but where xylitol is at the very least the, the number one ingredient. And when you're chewing gum, use those. And if you do that, chew two or three pieces a day, one or two pieces a day, if you're using toothpaste with xylitol in it, you're going to be fine. And, and it's going to change the microbiome of your mouth. And there's, you know, the, the, the studies that were done by the University of Michigan Dental School, where they went down to Belize and had kids use it. They had, they chewed three pieces of gum a day. When they came to school, they gave them a piece of gum. After lunch, they gave them a piece of gum. When they went home, they gave them a piece of gum. And on the weekends, they didn't chew gum. And over the summer, they didn't chew gum. But two years later, they had a negative incidence of tooth decay, which means the caries, the cavities that they had, had healed. Do you also have a mint so someone doesn't have to chew gum if they say have jaw problems or denture problems? Absolutely. And those I do have on my nose. Fantastic. Okay. That's and, what I eat all day. And it, I mean, do you, do you personally use them like candy or is one of them sufficient for the day? For oral health, I use them like candy. You do, yeah. They taste delicious too to you. I, I we have strawberry, we have a berry, we have a lemon, we have spearmint, we have wintergreen, we have peppermint. Yeah, they taste like candy. If if you took xylitol and put a tablespoon of xylitol in your hand, it looks exactly the same as sugar. And if you tasted it, it tastes exactly the same as sugar, except xylitol has a cooling effect. And so it'll cool your mouth, whereas it's table sugar won't. And it won't destroy your teeth. Correct. Are all of these products available nationally? So the Sprite products right now are available at, at a couple of your grocery stores. Um, but they're available at most of your natural retailers nationwide. Okay. The, the clear, the sinus care products, they're, they're available everywhere. And oral care products as well, everywhere? Well, the oral care is the Spry brand. Oh. And okay. so those are available at all of your natural retailers. They're available at, you know, uh, grocery stores like Harmon's here in Utah, Wegmans up in, in New England. Uh, I think they're getting picked up by Publix down in the South. We're, we're pushing those out into the, into the bigger chains um, over the next couple of years. 
we we did it in this step kind of a thing. We started putting the nasal sprays and the sinus care, the clear product line, out into those mass market retailers uh, four years ago, five years ago. Okay. So, and is it safe to order your products online via Amazon? Absolutely. Okay. Just want yeah. to make sure that they're authorized dealer. Yeah, we have we have a third party vendor that does all that. Okay. Yeah, and I mean people. We we sell. You can go into stores. I mean, in all over the world, in Turkey, South Africa, Australia, um, you know, a, a wide variety of countries where they're you can go buy it. Great, Nate. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that I should have, or that you would like to share with the viewers? Um. Well, I don't know what you should have asked, and if I can't think of it, but uh, um, you know, I mean, I think that 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 one of the things that I think is important is that people start to understand that that nasal hygiene does matter. And, you know, I'll, I'll use this as an analogy, and I, and I talk about this a lot, but uh, Ignaz Semmelweis wrote the very first paper on using, on, on physicians washing their hands between sick patients in 1848. Okay? I want you to take a guess, but when do you think it became standard of care for physicians in the United States to wash their hands between sick patients. Early 1900s. Do you want to guess again? Really? 1998. Okay. 1998. It was the hep C and the AIDS crisis that pushed that. Okay. I don't know how old you are. How old are you? I can't even tell. 90. Okay. So when you were a kid, your dentist did not wear gloves. Can't even remember. <laughs> My dentist didn't wear gloves. Okay, you would go into the doctors. They they didn't wash their hands between all their sick patients. Now you go into the doctor and they're they're changing their gloves between every patient. Right. Okay, that became standard of care in 1998. Hmm. So it took 150 years. And it even took 50 years for, for surgeons to wash their hands before they went into and operated on people. And that was Joseph Lister who, who started saying, hey, we've got to do this. We've got to do this. So, um, you know, it's so so it takes a long time for for uh, hygiene principles to get accepted by the medical community. I mean, another great one is you had a doctor who. I'm trying to think of when this was. It was in the 1800s, but he was trying to get the city of London to actually build a sewer system because he believed that if they did, they could stop having all these cholera epidemics. And the city of London said no way because doctors at that point still believed that cholera came from miasma. Okay. Are you familiar with that term? I hope you're not. But no. what it is, they believe that medicine, that, that illness came because of the bad vapors, which is why people would smell flowers and try to keep from getting sick by smelling flowers and pocket pools of posies and all this. <laughs> okay. It wasn't until after he died that the city of London actually went and put a sewer system in. But, and, and they stopped having typhoid or cholera epidemics at that point. Okay. But do you know why they put the sewer system in? No. Not because they believe that people got cholera from the sewer. They did it so they could get rid of the stench. Hmm. Okay. That's interesting. But this is the this is a doctor who's out there campaigning saying, hey, no, people get cholera because it's it's a bacteria, it's something that's in the sewage. This is why we're getting it. No, no. No, no, it's just a smell. Just put some flowers under your nose and you're going to be better. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. There's all of these things, you know, I mean, you can go back. I got all kinds of stories like this. I mean, you can go back to, to Lou, Lou of hook. I don't know how to say his name, right. But we would have had germ theory 200 years earlier. Wow. If the, if the physicians back then would have listened to a tailor because a tailor with a microscope took stuff out of his mouth put it in the microscope and he started drawing little bacteria and he wrote a paper about it but because he wasn't a doctor they threw it away they didn't believe it and it wasn't until louis pasteur came around 200 years later 
that the whole idea of germ theory was accepted. Interesting. Nate, do you believe or do you think that it would be beneficial for, say, every sports team, every airplane uh, terminal, the FAA literally hand out clear to every single passenger and they clean their nasal passage before they get on a plane? Well, of course, I have to answer that as a yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of course. No. It was a trick um, question, right? Yeah. What kind of a dumb question is that? Come on, man. This is kind of a loaded question. Not dumb. It's a great question. Um, well, let me let me address the sports one because there's actually um, research. And again, these are all on our webpage. You can go read them. These are done by independent doctors that don't have any affiliation with, with CLEAR that we don't pay. But there have been a number of papers done. Um, you know, the Dr. Nasuli that I mentioned earlier, he actually did one where he took people that were using saline and he had some of them use saline and some of them use our nasal spray and he measured their airway volume. You, when they used it once in the morning, once at night. And in three weeks, they had an improvement in their airway volume of 36%. Interesting. And if you suffer from, from breathing issues, having an improvement of 36% is huge. If you're an athlete, 36% is huge. Absolutely. There was another paper that where they used ultrasound. They measured the airway volume. They used clear. And three minutes later, they remeasured it using ultrasound. In three minutes, they had improved the airway volume by 20%. Wow. Okay. So, yes. And if people want to put that into their own lives, before you go to bed at night, if you could have, if your airway was open by, by that much, you're going to snore less. You're going to sleep better. Well, but as far as doing it on an airplane, um, I would I would actually say yes, and and for a different reason. And the reason is is the the air on an airplane. Like I'm I'm watching in the news now, and they're talking ridiculous stuff. But now they're they're saying that you have to have a vaccine to get on an airplane, which is ridiculous because that the, they've shown over and over that the air that you're breathing on the airplane. Is, you know, is some of the cleanest air you're ever going to breathe. Right. Okay? But the downside to the air on the airplane is it's also really, really dry. And if you're drying out your airway, we've already talked about this. If your airway is dry and your mucosal layer is dry, that's, all of that stuff is going to go right into your lungs or it's going to attach right onto that tissue. And, and that's why people get sick more often when they travel. It's because they dry out their airway and then they walk into the terminal which doesn't exchange the air as often as the airplane does, and they're exposed to all those pathogens and they get sick. So the goal is to keep your nose functioning. It's supposed to be your, the goal of our nasal spray is to support your immune system in trapping bacteria and trapping viruses and washing away dander and washing away pollen and assist your immune system in keeping your airway clean. Perhaps clear can get FAA approved. <laughs> Well, uh, as much as I fly, and I am a pilot, um, I don't, but, but uh, you know, I would, I would like that to happen. That would be kind of cool then for you, and, yeah. and professionally and personally. <laughs> so what are the, what are the questions you have? I mean, I can, I can answer questions. That's all I got, Nate. Oh. The clock, I don't want to uh, keep, keep you any longer than needed. Well, I appreciate it. Um, you know, if anybody has any questions, shoot me an email. Um, you know, just email me at clear. And, and I'll try to answer those questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time, Nate. I really do appreciate it. And everybody go check out www.clear.com. Thank you so much, Nate. Thank you. We all have a story to tell. Let's tell yours. Welcome to the Intellectual People Podcast with your host, Jason. Come together and listen to journey stories and more from interesting people. Welcome your host, Jason.